Thank you, Minister. Minister, I owe you an apology. Because when we were planning this session, uh, and looking at the format, I told the High Commissioner that having had a public lecture not too long ago, it would be difficult to get a large enough crowd. I totally underestimated the pull factor. She understood it very well. And she insisted, and we have this, I say almost the same faces, but much more. And I think they have come back to this situation. You are a very impressive speaker, fluent, elegant. You, are, you say your language with allusions to Hamlet and E.M. Foster. So people are confused by what you're saying. But that preamble was to that was a preamble to ask a not so pleasant a question. <laughs> because uh, I want you to talk a little, not talk, ask a question on ASEAN. What minister said is true that India treats ASEAN as a ASEAN as a central role in this part. Centrality of ASEAN. However, ASEAN is like a young woman, a dancer, with many many suitors. And suitors who come with flowers don't impress her that much as those who come with tangible economic opportunities. And what is happening is there are so many deals being struck between ASEAN and several of the major powers around with attractive economic patterns. We haven't seen the same from it. As a person from a very small country, I know that it is difficult for us to imagine the complexities of a large country like India. But having said that, there seems to be still room to use your, your, you know, your vast mark to get not only Singapore but the other ASEAN countries into a more productive, a more profitable sort of uh, relationship. What would you say if I said that Singapore, not only Singapore but uh, ASEAN generally, uh, is not moving that fast with India as with some of the other countries? Minister, for your comment, if I open it up. Uh, well, I, uh, I, I think that uh, if I had said that, uh, it would be more justified that uh, we want uh, more of uh, your attention to India. Uh, but if you say that you want uh, more uh, opportunity in India, my answer to you is, it's there. We will give it to you. Our commitment is to, to, give, uh, to give Singapore, ASEAN, and other friends who want to come and invest in our country the best opportunity. And I think that we've been working on that in the DMIC, for instance, we are looking at uh, investment uh, opportunities where all the, the delay issues that have been uh, a problem in the past have been addressed through uh, special uh, joint purpose, special purpose vehicles that get all the clearances in advance even before the investors come in. So I think there have been, there have been some issues of bureaucratic delays in our country that we have tried to address. I explained to you that we went through a difficult learning curve as far as our courts were concerned. And I do believe that now, uh, having gone through the worst, we are now able to deal with the courts uh, much better because uh, it's a learning curve not just for them, but it's a learning curve for us as well. I think we didn't put our case to them very well and they therefore didn't uh, give us the kind of judgments and attention that, that we deserved. Um, much of that is now behind us. And I do think that the efforts that the finance minister has made in recent weeks and months are efforts that will certainly become, uh, will make the landscape far more attractive for you. Uh, what I suggest is, uh, and I urge you, to have faith in India. Uh, it's, an important, it's, a, it's an important thing to have faith. Uh, you can be excited about what India offers in due course, but uh, to begin with, please come, have faith in us. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a lot 
of good that is going on, and a lot of that has come from you as well. Uh, I think let's look at the let's look at the success stories. Like it, let's look at the iconic iconic stories, and let's see if we can add muscle muscle to that. Uh, we are determined because uh, we know that there is no other path. This path of rapid growth is the only path that we have. Uh, we resolve many issues. We need to resolve resolve many more. But I think we can do it together. I can only promise you the best efforts. Thank you, Boot. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Uh, Mr. Bhutti. Well, Mr. Minister, congratulations. That was a very good speech, and uh, I hope what you said about your country will materialize and the difficulties that you have on the economic side are short lived. I'm originally from Pakistan. I was briefly finance minister of the country, so I know a lot of very senior people in Pakistan, and I've just come back after meeting with some of those people spend some time with you also. I come back with the following perception, which is that you have leadership in Pakistan now, which is very anxious to develop a solid economic relationship with India. Nawaz Sharif said yesterday or day before that he is prepared to walk more than half the way in order to have a good working, solid relationship. In your own speech, you said a lot about and so on. You did refer to enormous amount of opportunities in Central Asia and so on. My question to you is, and I have done some work in this area, that if we, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and so forth, cast off the burden of history and focus on economic issues, everybody benefits. Last year, I went to Delhi a couple of times at the invitation of couple of institutions. I made this speech in a kind of emotional way. And the answer that I got was somewhat disturbing. And in one session I said, are you saying to me that you treat Pakistan not as an opportunity, but as a problem? And one person said, you have beautifully summarized the attitude that we have in the country to our politics. What I am saying is, and I know this, dozens of conversations with people who really matter these days, that they are raring to go, but they are upset at the lack of response that they're getting from Delhi. And you are in a position where some of this could be fixed, and I know for certain that you will get an enormous response from Pakistan in order to make an economic relationship really work. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you very much. I, I think you're just uh, uh, urging me to uh, uh, join you in this uh, aspiration, uh, and I, I have uh, uh, I have no hesitation at all. Uh, I agree with what you've said. I think it's important. Uh, but uh, might I uh, might I just suggest that both Pakistan and India, uh, in our relationship, uh, show signs of schizophrenia. Uh, we, uh, we haven't been able to do with Pakistan, and you've not been able to do it with us, uh, that we have succeeded in doing with China. Uh, you know, we haven't had a single casualty of the Chinese border in our country. Two decades. Uh, we, do have, we do have a difference of perception. We do have some, some uh, uh, enormous psychological difficulties from time to time. Uh, but we've learned, we've learned to contain our differences. I think that's the very significant thing that's happened in India and China. We would, we would like to do that much more with Pakistan, because Pakistan is, in that sense, uh, uh, closer to us than China is. We, uh, we, uh, we rejoice in each other's company. Uh, when we meet uh, in unofficial meetings, uh, we are like long lost friends and brothers. Uh, we, 
we can't do without your music, and you can't do without our films. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think many of your people, their first destination, choice of destination is, is India. And for many of our people, particularly in North India, the first uh, uh, choice of, of destination is, is, is Pakistan. Our MPs go there and come back with remarkably, remarkably uh, you know, positive stories. And I'm sure that your MPs will come and meet us go back with similar stories. Yet, your parliament and our parliament passes uh, sort of stern messages to each other uh, periodically. And I think there is something, something that is missing somewhere. Now, there are various explanations of that. Who's in control, who's not in control. We have a wide media. We have a wide media, and your people from Pakistan are happy to come on our wide media and add to the and add to the wild uh, uh, exchanges that take place. Uh, I think if we didn't have the media, if we didn't have the media, we would be fine. But since neither you nor we can switch off the media, we should just ignore it. I think it's very important to ignore it. I stopped going to our media program, particularly when they want to ask me about Pakistan, because. The first thing they say to me is, you are a softie. Uh, despite the fact that your, our soldiers are being killed, you're still smiling and saying we should talk. And I then I have to say to them, would you like me to start killing as well? I mean, what do you want me to do? I think that it's important uh, that we do uh, something that our Prime Minister said to your Prime Minister during the meeting in, in, in New York. And I think that's language that both can use. Uh, our Prime Minister said to your Prime Minister, you'll have to show some leadership. You have to show some leadership. And he said, he looked at my Prime Minister, held his hand and said, you know, I was 14 months in jail and seven months, seven years outside my country. Don't you think that's leadership? Now, that was a good message between those two. And I really celebrated that. And I do believe that that's the message that must permeate at all levels in our country and yours. Uh, we do understand that the younger people in Pakistan, uh, during the campaign, supported, supported the Prime Minister's uh, uh, indication to them that he wanted a, a better relationship with, with India. So the answer, of course, lies in, in uh, giving up our historical baggage or putting it away for a while or re-fencing it as we've done with China, and then continuing. And frankly, when you asked us for power and electricity and gas, we assured of it ourselves, but we didn't say, can't give you. We immediately said we will give you. Right? And if it's a serious, if it's a serious demand, we will give it to you. And I think that if it means going an extra mile from our side, because he's coming an extra mile on his side, we will do it. So uh, an extra mile means that we won't meet in the Varga. We'll either meet in Pakistan or we'll meet in India. But we would welcome it. We would welcome it. But there are, pardon my saying so, there are some people in, uh, in the entire landscape that don't want us to be friends. So uh, I think if you, if, you, if you recall a particular scene from, it's in the end of Pastor India. Aziz and Fielding riding on two horses. And Fielding reaches out to him and says, Aziz, why can't we be friends? And a rock juts in, in between, and the horses part. And Aziz says, it looks that it can't be now, it can't be here. First we will throw you out and then we'll be friends. So it's that rock, it's that rock in between that we have to address. Uh, I'd be very happy to talk to you about how we can get over that rock. Another quote from Ian Foster. That's another quote from Ian Foster. Come, let's just. Hi, I didn't get here uh, from my CIT. Uh, thank you so much for a very honest and uh, genuine speech. I think we really like it. When you look at it from outside, uh, from India, the three areas that is concerned for any investor or any briefer matter one, judiciary. Especially the speed of judicial judgments in terms of cases drawing for 20, 30 years. Two, tax reforms, both direct and indirect. And the third, of course, corruption. The last 30, 40 years, whatever you talk about, these three areas still at a very primitive stage. What the government is doing 
the teeth back. Okay, um, uh, see, as far as, as far as the God systems are concerned, uh, we are very conscious that the gods take too long. Now it's a matter of what you prioritize and put on a fast track. Many courts now are dealing, are dealing with cases a lot faster than they did. The Supreme Court has a special committee and the, uh, uh, there is a separate setup as well. They are interfacing and interacting on how we can put the entire court system on a special grid by which all dependencies in any court will be known, the cause of the dependency will be known, that people will have better availability of precedence, and therefore, because of conflicting precedence, cases will not keep lingering and so on. There is an attitude and problem. There is also a problem of, of resources, and there's a problem of structure. We are trying to address that, and the idea was my predecessor in the Ministry of Law and Justice, Mr. Moy, had actually given a date uh, by which he said we will bring down the dependency to one third or one fourth. I tried to work on that as well. Some of the interesting experiments that we have done, for instance, in the Delhi High Court, we now have 10 courts in the Delhi High Court which are paperless courts. Uh, no judge has to take any file home, no paper gets lost, no paper has to be given physically. Judges come with a pen drive, their entire reading material on a pen drive, everything is available on a screen. You can do patents cases, you can do... So nobody has to say, I have to go and fetch this, I have to go and fetch that. The moment, the moment lower courts decide a criminal case in Delhi, the file of that criminal case automatically is transferred electronically to the High Court. So last, uh, the previous experience of having to wait for the files to come physically from one court to the other court is gone. Uh, the uh, court fees are now being paid through a gateway. Uh, that can be done electronically. You can get judgments electronically. A lot of this is, is beginning to happen. And I think in the next five years, we will be able to resolve it. For people interested in commercial transactions, I tried very hard to bring in a special system of fast track ports for high value commercial, commercial matters. It's got, it got stuck because there were different op opinions about whether you should have an appellate, uh, have an appeal in between the High Court and the Supreme Court or not, or should it go directly to the Supreme Court, and that's being worked out. But I think a lot of things uh, are also, uh, a lot of our problem was also caused by the time it took to appoint judges. And we now have new legislation on the anvil that will, all, will hopefully speed up the appointment of judges. We are addressing this issue. It's an important thing, and I am therefore very glad our Chief Justice has come to uh, is coming to Singapore in the next few days. I have uh, recommended to him that, that our judges should work more closely with judges here in Singapore uh, in order to learn systems and court management, which, which I think is a very critical part of, of, uh, uh, of court proceedings. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned the issue of tax reform. The tax reform is something that is a high priority with us. There are some issues on tax policy, for instance, the retrospective retrospective tax issues, etc., which Mr. Chidandram has, has already uh, tried to, to sort out, and I think over the next two months that issue will be sorted out. There's a little bit to be done by way of legislation, which will be done in December, but uh, otherwise, I think in terms of policy, that issue uh, that arose with the Wood Reform case is, is going to get, get resolved. Uh, our main, main thing is that the huge uh, tax uh, uh, reform that we we want to bring in is being stuck. It's being stuck because, not because people have fundamental differences of ideology, but um, there's, a strange, there's a strange thing happening in our politics these days that everyone wants to take credit for our legislation and they say, well, we'll do it in our time. Uh, and their time doesn't come, so they keep waiting for their time to come, but that's another story. On corruption, I'll tell you something very frankly. I don't believe India is half as corrupt as it's made out to be. There is a difference between being uh, messy, uh, making a dishonest mistake, and being corrupt. Uh, very sadly, very sadly in India, uh, agencies and, uh, and organizations have fudged the difference between an honest mistake and corruption. Uh, anyone who works will make an honest mistake. And I do believe that the investment sector you people prefer guys who made honest mistakes when they come to borrow money. Uh, because they say, well, this guy has made his mistakes now, he will not be a, a non-performing asset. 
But we have a problem. We don't see a difference between an honest mistake and, and corruption. And I think, therefore, when I said you know, courts have to deal uh, attitudinally with a lot of these issues, there is corruption. I'm not saying there's no corruption. But simply because you disagree with some policy decision, you can't say this policy decision is corrupt, right? Uh, corruption must be found in the way in which we all find corruption, which is there must be a physical quid pro quo. There must be something which is illegitimate that must be transferred. There must be some benefit that is that has been drawn, which is an illegitimate benefit. Simply because you're a big company, simply because you're a successful man, and you get a gold mine, doesn't mean that you're corrupt and I'm corrupt for giving it to you. So I urge everyone to learn to distinguish between an honest mistake and corruption. There is a difference. And I think we are maturing uh, as, as, as a system, and we will learn to make this distinction, which doesn't mean that you shouldn't reprimand a person for an honest mistake. You can. You can reprimand. You can encourage. You can reprimand. You can discourage. You can put in a disincentive. But that is not, that is not corruption. So, but having said that, to address corruption, the courts have done a lot. The courts have done a lot, and we encourage that. And we are happy to help them do that. But we are also putting in transparency systems. For instance, the right to information is a major is a is a major restriction now on, on corruption because whatever you do is to be is to come out in the open. Secondly, uh, we are now introducing uh, uh, the citizen charter so that people people will have a right to get a decision within a certain number of days, hours, or whatever. So there will be no incentive to delay something and then have a quick pro quo in order to do it. Thirdly, we are introducing some other, some other anti-corruption measures in various other fields, including government, government procurement and, and so on and so forth. So by the end of the year, I think we will have a very fairly stable uh, menu of what we can do to address corruption. But finally, finally, corruption is, uh, is, uh, it is an attitude. And I think that we have, to, we have to address that as well. And an attitude that changes by ensuring that honest people have incentives. Honest people must not have disincentives. So if we give honest people incentives, and I think that's part, that is part of the market uh, principle, that uh, you recognize in a market what is good and what is valuable and what is honest to be Yes. Hello, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Samar Bushi. Thank you very much for your message. Thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. Missed the, missed the previous sessions, so I'm glad I came back today. Um, I wanted to understand your perspective in your capacity as the external press minister of our country on the situation in the Maldives. Now, there has been a widespread disappointment in the Indian community, both in India and abroad, uh, both through conventional media and through social media, about the perceived lack of action from India and the passivity. Um, but I wanted to understand your perspective on this, uh, especially given the fears that you know, we are being encircled by China and so on and so forth. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. See, this is a very difficult, uh, it's a very difficult call for us. Uh, our relationship is with Maldives not with a political party or a political uh, individual in Maldives. Each one of us can have personal preferences because we work with some of them, uh, we know some of them well, we enjoy the company of some of them, but at the end of the day, uh, we deal uh, as, as a government, we deal with the government of Maldives. Now, we've never subscribed as a country, we've never subscribed as in, uh, uh, to the idea of, of intervention. Uh, we don't believe uh, in interfering in internal affairs of any country. And it can't be that we say to the world, don't interfere in something uh, that is our internal matter, or we will interfere in your internal matter. See, even in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, our position has been very consistent. Our position has been that there is no uh, value uh, and no sense and no moral, moral right in reordering a society from the outside, using military uh, intervention as a way of imposing your will upon the people. Even when you think something wrong is happening, you have to have some restraint upon yourself. Now, I do know that the United Nations have, have, are evolving and there are people who believe in, in, uh, 
and R2P right to protect, and uh, there are these uh, coalitions for the willing and so on. But India has never been party to this, and I think consistently with that position, we have said we are deeply disappointed in what happened in Maldives. Not just now, but earlier as well. And we, in a very restrained and in a very objective manner, uh, earlier also said we felt that there should be a free and fair election which is inclusive and there should be no attempt to exclude somebody from, from that election. And we said it not because it's good for India, we said it because it's good for Maldives. Uh, if you don't let everybody compete and you don't know who deserves and who doesn't deserve because of the preference of your people, you will never have a stable democracy. And that's what we insisted and we were very glad to see Maldives move towards a fair, fair election in which the results were in, in front of you. But they are not satisfied, the institutions are not satisfied, the Supreme Court is not satisfied, or any other institution is not satisfied, and they want to do it again, well, it's their choice. We can only say that as friends, as partners, it would be good for them, as indeed it would be good for everybody, if there was free and fair election, and whoever wins should be accepted as the leader of that country. We don't have our own choice and preference at all. Now, if we interfere, if we interfere, we may be giving a handle to somebody to say, India is playing the big brother. We don't want to play big brother. They are hugely dependent on us in many ways. And we cherish and value our friendship with them. We don't want to use any bargaining chip, except for what moral authority we have and whatever we believe that they would take as a serious advice coming from a country that cares for for Maldives is what we have done. Now the latest announcement is they will not be able to meet the 11 November date, but they are. But they will have an election between uh, just before 11 November and then later on at the second, in the second down 17. So we're keeping our fingers crossed, and we have categorically, along with other friends of Maldives, said that we do hope that the elections will go through and that uh, there will be no resort to violence on any side, that peacefully they should accept whatever the democratic decision is. So I know that sometimes people may say that, you know, uh, we are disappointed you're not intervening and interfering, but I think it's good for Maldives, good for us, and good for the world that we don't intervene. Good evening, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much for your honor, very honest and genuine speech. Um, what is our policy in foreign policy about genetically modified food and seeds bringing to India? What is our stance there? I think this is a this is a very uh, divided uh, house on this in India. I've, uh, my colleague uh, Sujana Ramesh has spent a lot of time, a lot of time arguing with a lot of people. Uh, when he was the uh, Minister for Environment. Of late, there is uh, less talk about, about this. Um, uh, but I think, that, uh, 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 I think that there are some reservations amongst stakeholders about genetically modified, modified uh, seeds. Um, not for the same reason, not for the same reason as maybe, uh, maybe seen elsewhere. We have some concerns, we have some concerns about Biodiversity. We have some con concerns about preserving, preserving, preserving indigenous uh, uh, material and, and seeds, and there is there is some evidence to the effect that some of these could be destructive of, of uh, uh, Indian breeds, uh, and therefore uh, worrisome. But amongst our scientists, there are two points of view. Uh, some believe it's good, and some believe it's not such a good idea. I think what, to honestly, what complicates is is the presence of large multinationals. Uh, when there's a presence of large multinationals, a lot of NGOs uh, working up against them, uh, then it becomes difficult to be objective. But I think the debate is still going on. It's, it, uh, uh, it escalates and then it, it, uh, it goes down a bit. But the debate and the jury is still out on it, as far as India is concerned. I'm sorry, we are a little running short of time, but there are two people here. The lady first, and then the gentleman. And after that, I'll uh, have to pass it to Madam Mohan. Give me Thank you. 
Your Excellency, could you please say a little bit more about the role of diaspora in the economic imperatives between foreign policy, given the recent rupee crisis? Or on the other side, the political side, a little bit more about even the historical example that you gave of recent period. What's the role of India's diaspora in foreign policy? So I think that the Indian diaspora has played a, a very, very important role, and I think it's in keeping with our assessment of their importance and value that uh, we created a separate ministry for overseas Indians. Uh, there has been an, uh, a growing engagement and uh, a growing participation of Indian diaspora. Uh, now you know that, uh, that uh, we've introduced the uh, PIO card the OPC within the uh, citizenship. Uh, we now allow, we now allow, allow uh, non-resident Indians to, uh, uh, to vote if they are registered as voters within the country, but they still have to travel to the country to vote. Uh, I think logistically and, and uh, for many other reasons, we haven't yet reached the level where they could vote wherever they are or go to the mission and vote, but I hope that in the future that will happen. Perhaps they can vote online. I think these things will, will happen. Now, a lot of the advantages that they had to begin with are advantages that are disappearing because the general base of, uh, of opportunity has been expanded. There was a time when there were exceptional options to the bank, which were not available to resident Indians. You know, and a lot of incentives that were given to them. Now those incentives have reduced uh, considerably because uh, in resident Indians also have been given the same same kind of opportunity. Uh, but there are still many, many important areas in which they continue to have an advantage and they continue to, uh, to take benefits of that advantage. Uh, but as far as uh, our engagement with them is concerned, uh, we do have the annual conference where uh, you know the diaspora comes and they make contributions and they learn about what is happening in the country. Uh, but I, I think that uh, we need to have a fresh look at it. Uh, diaspora of other countries, um, I think China for instance, are, are uh, really credited with an enormous amount of investment coming into, coming into China. Uh, I don't think that we and our diaspora compares that well with China as far as investment is concerned. But we value their contribution, we value their presence in the world, and I think that in uh, our engagement with the world, their presence is, is, is wonderful. I was, uh, I was in Canada recently, and every meeting I had in Canada with my, my counterpart or any other minister, across the table, uh, a majority of, of people uh, were, were, largely, were largely of Indian origin. And at the lunch, the foreign minister actually said, uh, don't worry, I'm the only white man here, uh, because the rest look like you. Uh, now, I think this is a wonderful thing that the world is changing, and that our, our people are now second their generation, third generation, doing so remarkably well. Some of them are in top offices, uh, political offices in parliament and senate, governors of states in the US. Uh, I met many parliamentarians in, in Canada, uh, of, of Indian origin, and it's, uh, it's, 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 very, it's, it's, it's very satisfying and very gratifying that we are doing so well in the world. Um, Minister, with your permission, I cannot let this opportunity pass. Singapore is going to have a South Asian diaspora <laughs> convention, November 21st and 22nd. This is a word from the sponsor. It's organized, <laughs> it's organized by, by the South Asian and with several leaders from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh are coming with. Please come for that and we can discuss this. Next, the last question. Please then. Minister, it's been a wonderful evening. Um, two, two things I'd love to hear your, your views on. One, um, from your vantage point, which is a very, very senior person in the Indian establishment, what do you believe are the principal risks that that keep you awake at night from an economic perspective. What can India have? What could happen which could hurt Indian economy badly? And a second one, and I like to bring uh, why does every political party still send their spokesperson to participate in the late night jamboree that happens every night? Um, 
That's good. It's our, our commitment to our commitment to free speech and television um, that makes us send our people there. Um, they actually, it's almost in the nature of sending somebody to the slaughterhouse. Um, it's just that they survive and come back to fight another day. Uh, as you see, as you know, I, I now vote very seldom because uh, I think that the, it had, it's a case of diminishing returns. Um, it's sad, it is sad, but I think we, our country deserves uh, more rational conversations between political parties to offer a range of options to people to choose from and, uh, and not to be screaming and shouting at each other. But uh, it's the, uh, this is the late, latest version of the Indian uh, soap opera. Uh, so I think if you just take it in that spirit, uh, then it will, not, it will not at least make you lose your night sleep. Uh, I don't lose my night sleep over it. Uh, in fact, it often puts me to sleep. <laughs> Uh, what, what do I really worry about? Uh, I think what, uh, what, we, what we really worry, we don't really worry about fundamentals, but we worry about lost opportunities. Uh, we think that the world is moving very fast. Uh, we cherish our democracy and we value our democracy. Uh, we couldn't really agree with, with, uh, uh, with former Prime Minister Mahathir when he at a lecture in India said, you know, what you suffer from is an excess of, of democracy. Uh, we don't really, we don't uh, 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 really believe that uh, because we do cherish our democracy. It's sometimes noisy, sometimes untidy, sometimes, uh, sometimes painful, sometimes aggressive, but we value it because I think any other, any other option would be uh, far more detrimental to our intellectual uh, growth than, than uh, an entirely democracy is. But what we do worry about, and I think that does, uh, it's a very serious matter, is that we shouldn't lose uh, the opportunity that we have. Um, whatever uh, Ambassador Pillay uh, said right at the beginning, about some doubt about our intent and our determination and our commitment, our ability and capacity, to respond to uh, friendly investors uh, from Singapore, for instance, coming to India. Uh, now, if that becomes true, uh, there are obviously elements of this which uh, we have to address and, and that we have to then ensure that we convey to you that we have addressed and then we show uh, the proof of the pudding is in, is in eating. Uh, we show that the pudding is, is uh, does taste good. But if we miss out on this, because we get preoccupied with divisive politics at home, uh, one upmanship at home, and, uh, and allow the decibels of our political discourse or lack of it to defeat the purpose today uh, of a national cause to get India moving, we would be, we would be in trouble. Uh, I think that uh, while all of you can play a very important role in India's growth story, I do understand that ultimately the responsibility rests on our own shoulders. And those of us who are elected to represent uh, Indians in Parliament and, and, to, uh, 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 and to serve them in government obviously have that much of a larger responsibility and therefore uh, more reasons for losing our sleep. But uh, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. We work hard, we get tired and we get good night's sleep. And then we wake up in the morning and we, uh, we begin again. So uh, there's a lot of hard work to do. But I think that uh, we'll get there. We will overcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Minister. I think you answered the questions very comprehensively at the point. I will not make a lot of time to speak because Marian Mohan is waiting in this text. So I will now ask him to. Mr. Narayan Mohan, the Chairman of the Singapore Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Thank you, Minister. His Excellency Shri Salman Kushi, External Affairs Minister, Government of India, Her Excellency, Mrs. Vijay Thakur Singh, High Commissioner to Singapore, Ambassador Gopinath Pillai, 
chairman of ISAS Institute of South Asian Studies, Mr. Japandi, past chairman of India Business Forum, Mr. Venkat, president of ICIH in the chapter. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am moved by your confidence in India with your elegant speech and also created a lot of confidence in the minds of all of us here and also we are very, very confident that India will grow in the future and also will achieve the 5% and the 8% growth in the year years to come by God's grace. I would like to firstly thank not only you and also um, our Mr. Ambassador Gopinath Pillai for moderating the dialogue section today. Uh, Girija Pandey has briefed us also about the outstanding uh, career which you had and as a minister and about your past history and also the various uh, enthusiastically you have written the books which has been made known to the audience here. The minister also interacted and highlighted matters concerning with India's economy, India's relationship with uh, all the countries in the world like US, China and uh, ASEAN and uh, he also has gone out to talk about the foreign policies India is taking out with all the countries and especially with Pakistan and also the interest in developing a greater relationship with Pakistan so that uh, things will move well for both the countries' economies. Asia seems to outspace the rest of the world over the next few decades with China and India expected to become a significant global growth engines. India's recent, uh, recent rupee crisis is uh, on its road to recovery and we hope that it recover faster as this was giving us a lot of confidence. Not only the, the deficit will come down from 5% to 2.5%, to, to sorry, 4.9% to 2.4% is what he is expecting for. Minister has said that Singapore is an inspiration and explain about the success story and the country is close relationship with India. Uh, among the ASEAN and the relationship with ASEAN is also growing fast and it's good for the India's economies to grow. Uh, not only touched on the various issues about the growth story, the new equitable society India is moving towards and also about the people started looking into the government for the business needs. Foreign policy which is talked about also which is not only equitable, it's also globally looked into with national consensus and he also talked about Gandhiji's uh, era, talked about Jawaharlal Nehru's era and make us to go back to the history. Uh, we are moved and thrilled by your speech, sir. Minister also informed us about Loki's policy dimension involved investment and technology. He also talked about India is also interested to look, look to increase the external economy and I think immediately about Singapore which has built up a large external economy to support the uh, Singapore economy. India will certainly achieve and it's happening which we are also seeing now. Saving rate is going in India which is always constantly there and uh, that's the next level in most of the Indians in India. A very interesting thing when she was asking about diaspora, I also would like to add to that where the India is getting the maximum number of remittances among the countries in the world. India gets nearly 70 billion dollars of remittance followed by China, Philippines and the rest of the countries. So all these things are going to augment the growth of India, certainly it's going to 5% growth when compared to most of the countries in the world is certainly good because when the, when the economy is developing, the chances, the rate of getting the growth rate higher and higher is going to be more and more difficult, which all of you know about it. All the learned audience here will be aware about it. I'd like to conclude my speech and also would like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to the Confederation of Indian Industry, NUS ISAS, ICII, Sindhu Chapter, SICCI, where I'm part of that for supporting today's function. I would also like to give a heartfelt word of thanks to all our distinguished guests who have graciously accepted the invitation and made their presence here. Thank you.